All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Division Three monthly webinar. My name is Tori Berg, and I'm an Associate Director for Academic and Membership Affairs, part of the D3 team. I'm here with you for the next 30 minutes to talk about all things 2024 convention proposals, as well as a couple of other AMA updates. My co-pilot today is Katie Mucci, so if you have any questions, um, as we go along, please use the Q&A function at the top of your screen. We're going to get those questions answered as best we can. Uh, also, depending on the nature of the proposal we're talking about and the nature of the question, I may have a couple of other friends hop on to get us some answers. Finally, this PDF is available sometime today on the webinar's webpage if it's not already up there, and a recording of this webinar will be uploaded by the end of the week which is slightly terrifying for me. All right, so let's dive in. Uh, the legislative cycle in 2024 has been just slightly calmer than it was in 2023, but even though there aren't any proposals this year that are competing against each other and there aren't as many as we had last year, we're gonna start off in the same place that we started off this time last year, and that's with our convention resources. Um, so the ones that are going to be most helpful for you as um, we approach convention from a legislative standpoint are on this slide. On the left is the D3 official notice. It's where you can find every proposal, every piece of non-controversial legislation, every editorial revision in its bolded, underlined, or struck through glory. On the right side of the slide, something equally as important, and that is the proposal Q&A document. So this is something that staff puts together each year, and it's aimed at walking you through the application and the procedural questions that might be on your mind for each of the proposals that are going up for a vote. Both of these resources and others, like the full convention schedule, are available at the links on the slide. So the Legislative Actions and Issues page and the 2024 Convention Resources page on nca.org. The question and answer document can also be found on LSDBI. There was an announcement um, blasted out to the membership when we published that last week. So we're gonna start with the presidential grouping of proposals, or I should say proposal, because there's only one this year. Um, proposal number one, the Division Three Philosophy Statement. Currently, the philosophy statement consists of 18 different principles that are used to guide the actions and decisions of D3. Right now, it is outlined in Bylaw 2011, and it's been a while since the statement has really gone through a full top-to-bottom review um, and revision. The proposal, which originated with a working group from the Strategic Planning and Finance Committee and then worked its way up to Management Council and then ultimately got sponsorship from President's Council, would replace in its entirety what we currently have as a Division Three philosophy statement. The working group solicited feedback from a lot of different sections of the membership over the last year, and it feels that this proposal combines elements from the NCA Constitution with the fundamental principles of Division Three, as D3 currently stands in this time. One note on proposal number one, it focuses solely on the philosophy statement. So if proposal one is adopted by the membership, only the philosophy statement will change. No operating bylaws will change along with it. Now you may be thinking, cool, sounds well and good, doesn't seem too complicated, but what are we really talking about here? What is the current philosophy in Division Three? What would Proposal 1 potentially change about that philosophy statement? And so this slide has a little bit of a snippet of a chart that's been prepared that is um, available for your use so that you can go line by line and compare the current statement to the one proposed by Proposal 1. It will tell you which language is staying, uh, which language is being added, what's been revised, or maybe even what's being removed entirely. So again, this is just a snippet, a little screenshot of one part of the chart. If you're interested in seeing the full chart, go check out the question and answer document um, that I referenced on the resource slide. Um, especially after last year, uh, what's a D3 business session without a little parliamentary fun? 
uh, we've got more for you coming up in January because this year there have been two amendments submitted that are looking to adjust portions of proposal one. Both of the amendments were sponsored by two multi-sport conferences, the Middle Atlantic Conference and the North Coast Athletic Conference. The first amendment, we're gonna call it 1-1 so that I don't say amendment to amendment 1 million times during this webinar, is looking to retain language from the current philosophy statement regarding the focus of Division Three athletics being a four-year undergraduate experience. That language is not currently included in Proposal 1. The second amendment, we're going to call that one, one, two, is also looking to retain some language from the current philosophy statement that is not in Proposal 1. Specifically, it's looking to include the clause that D3 does not award financial aid to any student based on athletics leadership, ability, participation, or performance. So again, both of these amendments are hoping to add some language that's in the current philosophy statement, bylaw 2011, but not in proposal number one. And so let's take a look at how this is all gonna go down in January. This slide represents the process for proposal one and for each amendment, one one and one two. We're gonna start on the left, Proposal one will be moved by a member of President's Council and it will be seconded. And then we're gonna to move to the right side of the slide and deal with each amendment one one and one two separately. So a member of one of the sponsoring conferences will move the first amendment, it will be seconded. And then there's gonna be a discussion about the pros, the cons, the good, the bad about that specific amendment one one. Do you want language that says Division Three Athletics is primarily a four-year undergraduate experience in the philosophy statement? If the answer to that is yes, then you're going to vote to support Amendment 1-1. If the answer to that is no, then you're going to vote to oppose Amendment 1-1. If the outcome of that vote is in favor of the amendment, Proposal 1 will be amended to include language about a four-year undergraduate experience. If the vote opposes 1-1, one, one, Proposal 1 will go on to an ultimate vote as originally submitted without any language referring to a four-year undergraduate experience. So once we take care of Amendment 1-1, one, one, we're gonna repeat the process with Amendment 1-2. So again, a member of one of the sponsoring conferences will stand up, move Amendment 1-2, and it will be seconded. Then we're going to have a discussion, the merits, the good, the bad, the pros and the cons of 1-2. So do you want language about awarding financial aid considering athletics leadership, ability, participation, or performance in the philosophy statement? Again, if the answer to that is yes, you would vote to support Amendment 1-2. If the answer is no, you would vote to oppose Amendment 1-2. Then we'll have a vote on that amendment. And if the outcome of the vote is in favor, Proposal 1 will be amended to add the existing language about financial aid into the proposal. If the vote opposes Amendment 1-2, Proposal 1 will go on as originally submitted without that financial aid language. Once the discussion and voting on amendments is complete, we're going to go back to the left side of the slide and we're going to consider proposal one as a whole. So there will be discussion as the proposal on the proposal, excuse me, as amended by one or both of the amendments or as originally submitted if both amendments are defeated. Finally, as there always is on every proposal we have, there's going to be a vote. So if the majority of the membership supports Proposal 1, we will have a new D3 philosophy statement. If, however, Proposal 1 is defeated, the existing D3 philosophy statement will remain in place. So what's outlined in Bylaw 2011. One thing I did want to mention before we move in to the other proposals is that last year, you might remember, we had a couple of special rules. We had ask the membership to maybe rank their preferred options to determine the voting order on different sets of proposals. 
And then if the preferred option was defeated, we brought back the other option to have its chance versus the current rule. That is not how things will work with this proposal one and the two amendments this year. There will not be an opportunity to reconsider the proposal once the vote on proposal one, either as amended or as originally submitted, takes place. So Katie, that was a lot, even though it was just one proposal. Do we have anything in the queue or what do we have in the queue? We do have one question in the queue right now. So the question is, how does amendment 2412 or 24-1-2 impact multi-divisional division three schools that have one or two division one programs? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the, the amendment one, two has to do with financial aid and awarding financial aid, um, not awarding, I should say, financial aid based on athletics, leadership, ability, participation, or performance. Our, multi, our multi-divisional institutions that have been grandfathered in to offer athletically related financial aid to their division one programs would still be content still be able to offer that athletically related financial aid. Remember, those multi-divisional institutions that have the ability to grant those athletic scholarships operate those programs as Division I programs, so they wouldn't be subject to the Division Three philosophy statement for those sports. That is the only question. Oh, actually, one more question. Okay. Could we get the survey results on the philosophy statement sent out again? Yeah, I'm going to call one of my friends, Eric. I don't know if you have your hands on those survey results um, and be able to answer that one for me. We can make that happen. All right. Awesome. Short and sweet. I like it. Okay, that is the last question we have currently. All right. Awesome. So we are going to move now into the general grouping, which covers the remaining three proposals, proposal two through proposal four. And hopefully things go a little bit more quickly uh, than proposal one. So proposal number two, it deals with the amendment to amendment period in the division three legislative process. Currently as part of the legislative process, member institutions or conferences submit ideas for proposals annually by July 15th. Then for a time period between July 15th and September 15th, sponsors of that proposal can submit amendments to either expand or restrict their original idea. Once September 15th hits, there's still opportunity to change the original proposal. However, any amendments that are submitted between then and November 1st may only restrict the original idea. So think of the current legislation as a point on a line. A proposal when it's originally submitted changes something about the current legislation. Between July 15th and September 15th, sponsors of the original idea can submit amendments to make their idea more different or less different than the current rule. Then between September 15th and November 1st, they can still submit changes, but those changes have to live somewhere between the current rule and their original idea that they submitted back in July. Proposal two is our only membership sponsored proposal this cycle. It was submitted by the Empire Eight Conference and co-sponsored by the Allegheny Mountain Collegiate Conference. It would permit proposal sponsors to submit amendments to either expand or restrict their original idea, not only through September 15th, but all the way to November 1st. All right, two down, two to go. Proposal number three deals with the minimum participants in the sport of tennis. So currently as a condition of D3 membership and in order to stay an active division three member in good standing, institutions must sponsor a minimum number of sports each year, depending on their undergraduate enrollment numbers. In order to consider an individual sport successfully sponsored, the team must participate in a minimum number of contests and have a minimum number of student athletes participate in those contests. Right now, per bylaw 2011-38, that for tennis is currently 10 contests with at least six participants at each. 
Proposal three comes to us by way of the Division Three Championships Committee and then up through Management Council. And it would see the minimum number of participants to count a tennis match for sports sponsorship decrease from six currently to four. This would then match the sponsorship number with the minimum number of participants that are required to complete the match per tennis's current playing rules. Our final proposal for January, uh, proposal four, hopefully looks familiar to you because it was actually on the docket back in January before being pulled and referred back to the governance structure for a closer look and some more review. It deals with the emerging sports for women list. So let's first uh, review a couple of items about what that designation means. Uh, the emerging sports list is there to help sports grow and provide more participation opportunities, especially for women. Uh, Bylaw 20.0261 outlines the timeline for being on the list. Um, ideally, when added, sports are either reaching or making significant progress towards championship level sponsorship within 10 years of being put on the emerging sports list. If a sport is added to the emerging list, institutions may elect to sponsor that team or that sport at the varsity level. If they do that, then they're expected to follow all NCA legislation as well as all Division III rules. And finally, the sport that Proposal 4 is dealing with is Stunt. It is currently on the emerging list for Division I and Division II, but is not currently on the list for us in Division Three. So what exactly would proposal four do? You probably guessed, if adopted, it is going to add the sport of stunt to the emerging sports for women list in division three. Um, as a result, we would establish playing and practice season legislation for institutions who wanna sponsor it at the varsity level. And that sport would be able to be used for an institution sports sponsorship purposes. Katie, this is my second break. Any questions in the queue for proposals two, three, or four? Not yet. All right, awesome. So we are gonna finish up with a couple of AMA updates, not related to proposals for convention in January, but still really important. We're gonna start with the mental health hardship waiver pilot program. It's a mouthful, but it's important. And I think at this point, you have probably heard at least some of this information, but I wanted to make sure that we took some time on this webinar to get us all on the same page, having the same information. So especially as our fall sports are wrapping up, you may be um, looking to start submitting some of these types of requests. So after many months of discussion, the pilot program is official and it's gonna be in place for this current academic year of 23-24 and next year, 24-25. The pilot program is gonna look at hardship waiver requests where the assertion is not a physical injury to the student athlete, but it's a mental health condition that is preventing them from successfully completing their season. Previously, if cases like this um, were submitted, they would have been processed the same way and with the same criteria as physical injuries. And so this pilot program is going to let us collect some information to determine if a legislative change specific to mental health conditions might be warranted for D3 uh, in the future. And before we go into the criteria, I've got a whole slide about it coming up. One more important thing only seasons charged during the 23-24 year and the 24-25 year will be processed under this pilot program and the flexibility that we're going to talk about. If you have a student athlete who experienced a season-ending men mental health condition in 22-23, in 21-22, or any previous academic year, definitely still submit that case to your conference office but know that your commissioner who's looking at the case is going to process it and decide it using the existing bylaw 1425 criteria, not the criteria of the pilot program. 
All right, so this slide is the pilot program. On the left, you've got the criteria, and on the right is the process. Sorry, my spacing's a little funky there, but Katie tells me it'll look good on the PDF slide, so um, we should be good there. But when we talk about the criteria, the one third in the first half hopefully look familiar to you because they are the same thresholds that are in place for all hardship waivers. So if you look up bylaw 1425, you are going to see one third and one half. Where the pilot program for assertions of mental health differs from assertions of physical injuries is in the documentation standards. So previously, in order to secure an approved hardship waiver, the medical documentation that you submitted had to be contemporaneous and it could only come from a physician. For cases that assert a mental health condition under the pilot program, the documentation can be contemporaneous in the moment or non-contemporaneous, so after the fact. And it can come from a physician still, or it can come from any licensed practitioner who's qualified to diagnose a mental health condition. So if you're wondering who those individuals are, what licensures might be considered legitimate to submit that sort of paperwork, check out the link that's in parentheses on this slide. It is to the Inner Association Consensus Mental Health Best Practices document, and it provides some answers and some guidance that um, our friends in the Sports Science Institute have said, yep, these people are legitimate and they can submit medical documentation for these hardship waiver requests. The process for the pilot program in the box on the right, luckily it's the same process that you all go through already. So the injury, or in this case, the mental health condition occurs, it affects the student athlete's ability to complete the season successfully. The case is submitted to your conference office for um, processing. Um, the asterisk is up there for our couple of independent institutions. If you all have a hardship waiver request of this type, we would ask that you submit that directly to staff through RSRO. And then that request is either, either going to be approved or denied. If it's approved, awesome. Your student athlete has gotten their season back. They are good to go. If it is denied, the case may be appealed to NCA staff through RSRO. And then even on top of that, there's an appeal opportunity, um, if you believe that it is warranted, to the Division Three Committee on Student-Athlete Reinstatement. One more slide for the pilot program. I mentioned at the beginning that we are going to be collecting some information over the next two years to determine if a legislative change is warranted. Here's the info that I was talking about. Here's what we're going to be asking your commissioners for. Uh, we are going to ask them, how many cases are you getting? And then how many are being approved? How many are being denied? For the ones that you're approving, what type of documentation are they giving you? Is it contemporaneous? Is it non-contemporaneous? And who is it coming from? So what is what are the credentials? What is the licensure of the medical individual who's giving you that documentation? And then specific to each of the denials that we're tracking, we're gonna ask the commissioners to tell us which criteria were not met by the student athlete who submitted the case. Did they play in too many games? Did they play in the second half of the season? Was the medical documentation not where it needed to be? That's the sort of information that we're gonna be looking for on the denials. All right, my last update, um, and I kind of feel like it maybe will be an early holiday gift for most of you. I know staff is very excited about it, and it is that the practice start date calendar is up and running for the 24-25 academic year. So if you are out there and you're working with your fall sport coaches in sports other than football, and you're planning your start dates for your season, um, fall 24, you don't want to do things by hand anymore because that's what we've been telling you over the last couple of months. The calculator is up, it's ready, and it will do the work for you. It'll do the math for you so you know when you can begin next fall. So hopefully that's very exciting. Um, I know a lot of people have kind of been chomping at the bit in order to get their seasons planned for next year.
And Katie, that's my last slide. If there's anything in the Q&A, we, we can handle those. There is. Oh, awesome. So first one I'm going to give you was on something you just talked about, which was the mental health hardship waiver. Okay. Um, as a student athlete who remains on the team and practices in the second half of a season, but doesn't compete, but does not compete eligible for a mental health hardship waiver? Yeah, that's a great question. So the answer to that question would depend on what their status is medically. So we have a bylaw that says if you have had an incapacitating season ending injury, in this case, mental health condition, um, and you are cleared to practice or, or, or partake in rehab activities as part of your recovery from that injury, that doesn't stop you from qualifying for a hardship waiver. If, however, you have been cleared to compete or fully return to play and you just decide to practice, we would say that student athlete does not meet the criteria for a hardship waiver. So it all has to do with your medical status and what that either physician or licensed mental health professional um, puts in into the paperwork. Thank you. And another question going back to the tennis proposal. Um, how many waivers has the membership committee reviewed to lower the tennis participation numbers due to sponsorship concerns? Yeah, awesome question. So I might also ask Eric to pop on. I know I used to be on the membership committee. Sports sponsorship waivers um, are a yearly occurrence. There are always institutions that are submitting mitigation to explain maybe why they didn't hit their five and five or six and six threshold. Um, and I can speak from my time on the committee. It was often sports like tennis, like cross country, like swimming and diving. So I think often um, something like tennis might be the difference between a uh, school successfully meeting their five and five or six and six threshold um, or not. So I don't know if Eric, you have anything extra to add for me there, but that's my answer. <laughs> Uh, your your memory is excellent, Corey, um, awesome. and it and and that theme continues to hold true. the um, The majority of waiver requests we see come in the sports of women's tennis, women's golf, women's cross country. That was the last of the two questions I received. All right. Well. I just want to say thank you for everyone for joining in today. If you have questions about anything that you heard me chat about today, whether it be proposals or whether it be the mental health hardship waiver pilot program, feel free to shoot those into staff. Check out the Q&A document. If you have questions about the proposals, head into RSRO. We will help you get everything sorted. Um, and then obviously we will see you all at January in convention. I'm going to be rocking the issues forum. So if you have questions, come there and we will do our best to get them answered so that you're making great informed decisions come Saturday morning at the business session. So thanks again, everyone. Hope you have a very merry, joyous, happy, whatever holiday season that you celebrate. And we'll see you in Phoenix.